Hi everyone. We are very happy today to have um, Harun Sharif here with us. He is a he is currently a senior advisor to the UN and he has been a minister. Uh, he is a visiting professor at uh, Cambridge, Sussex, NDU, LSE. He is also a graduate from there and he's worked in the World Bank and UK government. and on the side he is a tier tennis player and he is a fantastic cook so we are going to keep it very interesting and uh, basically we are targeting towards the youth uh, of our country whatever age they are whichever place they are even in the world so we are going to reach out to all of them and we are going to try and understand what the economy is really all about so let's hear it from the london school of economics uh, expert and thank you very much first of all for inviting uh, economy could be a very dry topic and it could be extremely exciting <clears throat> so i'll try and make it a little bit in between because we need to understand a few things first and we are focusing on pakistan uh, specifically so what i would like to start with that we are bombarded at the moment with analysts commentators Uh, econ- economic experts and frankly speaking that has created so much noise that people's questions have not been really answered now the social media particularly needs to be very responsible that you speak about truth you speak about evidence based and you speak about fundamentals which have been defined you know uh, how to read the economy so i just wanted to set the context right Now in Pakistan's economy, couple of things which we need to understand before we go any forward. First of all, uh, uh, we need to understand what makes the economy. Now, economy basically in an ordinary, normal country uh, has three components, which actually what we call growth uh, GDP, which is the gross domestic product. So it is the industry of that country. it is the agriculture produce of that country and third are services which you produce which means you know hoteling banking transport social media these are all services so in pakistan's economy basically in the past 30 years the share of agriculture and share of industry has not increased so that's an important point to start with whereas share of services has gone up almost 60% so 60% of pakistan's economy like what we produce or what the money we generate comes out of the services sector now the remaining 40% comes from the industrial sector almost 22% and 20% comes from the agriculture sector now one should question that a country which is predominantly agriculture why are we not you know making more out of agriculture and i try and answer these questions whereas there are certain countries like oil producing countries who are basically blessed with some endowment they have a different economic fundamentals but i am basically telling the large country with a population of 220 million people almost over a 100 million people under the age of 30 now in that country when you speak of services services are normally part of a skill because you are offering a service so that is the human being you have a skill you sell it if if an artist you paint you sell it that does not create the required number of jobs in a very populous country a services sector will do wonders in an economy like dubai which is a very small island uh, a, a small people uh, a highly uh, you know uh, 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 high income people but not in countries like indonesia or pakistan or india or turkey so this background i gave a little longer just to understand that where pakistan's economy stands now this is what we call structure of economy so the structure of the second question to young minds and others would be uh, we read the terms like rising asia 
Asian tigers, Japan has moved on, China has become a global power. If, if I look at it in the next 20 to 25 years, five of the Asian countries will be among the top 10 global powers, in fact, bigger than the European countries like Indonesia, Korea, Japan, China, Malaysia. So why not us? Now that is the question which youth and us need to question ourselves time and again. If others can do it, where did we go wrong? So what has happened, Shirin, is that uh, the structure of our economy has not changed, where other countries has moved on. Now, how do you change the structure? I'll give you a simple example. In your household, uh, if you have another member of the family, so what do you do normally? To accommodate, you need a physical infrastructure, you need an extra room, an air conditioner to accommodate the person, right? But you have to increase your level of income to keep that person at the level of others, at least if not going up. Now, how do you basically increase the level of income which is sustainable? Now, level of income, the word is sustainable. You can borrow money from the bank, but is it sustainable? You can basically cut down the expenses of others, but do you think it's a good thing? What will happen is your electricity bill will go up, you know, because somebody else, your food bill will go up, and your day-to-day -day transport bill will go up. Now, somebody has to finance that. So in Pakistan, what's happening is that we are adding population, but the structure of economy is not producing more so we are continuously borrowing to feed that additional population. Now, if, and then the limit comes that you basically are become what we call in economics, a highly indebted country. So we live on borrowed money because we have not changed the structure of economy for the past 30 to 35 years. A number of people ask me when I speak on television or in academia or global forums, that why does Pakistan have to go to IMF every five years? Now that's the answer which I'm giving. When your structure of economy will not change, the pressures of inflation, because population is going up, you are not producing enough to feed your people or to equip your people. So you are importing that stuff. Because you are not producing it, so you have to take it from somewhere. So when you are importing that stuff, you need dollars to pay the import bill. But where would dollars come from? Dollars, technically, if dollars are coming from our exports that we are selling something, then it matches the import. But if dollars are coming from money borrowed from the World Bank and the money borrowed from uh, uh, expatriate Pakistanis, which you have to repay, that is where the structure get flawed and then you, when, the, the, when you can't pay your bill, you go running to IMF to bail you out. So IMF basically is what in the local language we say, uh, is the lender of last resort, that now you have no choice, but please give me money. So they come with a stick, okay, I'm giving you money, discipline this, discipline this. But how to, if we need to grow, we need to break. And to answer your question again, now what are the challenges? Uh, I'll come later, but the fundamental channel in Pakistan is that 20 million young people are coming in the job market every year. 20 million people coming in the job market. Uh, so how do you create decent employment for them if you are not producing enough? Uh, particularly what we call the real sector, which are agriculture and industry. Now, in services, what is the biggest fashion in the urban areas? Real estate. Everybody is buying a corner plot. Everybody is trading in plots. Does that create employment? Has anybody thought? What you are doing is you are setting up a new restaurant. What? Like 10 people you can hire? So if you need to engage such a large labor force and a young labor force, you need to create such businesses which can absorb them, which can train them, which can groom them and give them a decent living. 
otherwise the pressures will continue to rise the frustration will continue to flow which we are seeing half of you said let's not make it political but half of these political transaction which we are seeing are actually emanating from economic pressures and frustrations so the country's politics in terms of for almost 50 years what we call is that there's an elite capture elite capture is ke in your uh, 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 particular in a feudal environment in a village uh, a feudal lord and his family they keep getting richer and richer whereas the workers lives always remain the same and that is what is the capture of an economy they do it by force here we do it through our political uh, what we call uh, patronage based networks we have families who support each other we have a rich elite which doesn't want to let anybody else into that the only way countries have broken that cycle is that young ideas innovative entrepreneurs who basically challenge those even in the united states bill gates came out of a garage and then challenged everybody if you look at that so pakistan needs to look at a younger uh, 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 middle level entrepreneurship rather than everybody looking for a job because a job with the same elite will never let you reach at a level where you can have an influence so i wanted to give you both sides uh, and economy if we need to grow there is a very simple now let me give you the theory there are three elements Uh, and then i'll stop on the first question uh, any economy needs capital which is what we call investment then you need labor we have plenty of labor we have no capital coming in the economy no investment coming and to accelerate the process you need technology because technology will speed up and make it up so we have lots of labor uh, relatively unskilled we the capital we are generating either through tax payers money or loans and that is where the danger is because it's not coming as investment it is basically to be repaid so it's not permanent capital so we need to focus on increasing and people who are watching me my advice is that politicians particularly will give you all kind of numbers oh we sold this much our export gone up inflation gone down don't listen to that you need to understand economic fundamentals are always linked to a percentage to gdp look at the numbers where you were last year if our debt to gdp was 80% check what is this this year that will tell you where you are our investment to gdp ratio is less than 15% for the past 30 years whereas the other asian countries are double than that so what i had the opportunity to meet uh, malaysia's ruler uh, uh, mahathir mohammad three times and i discussed this question because he revolutionized malaysia and he basically said that you need to open up your minds open up your systems let people make money don't create any hurdles in fact they are the vips who are investing unfortunately we are still in that post colonial mindset where we think that government is the giver actually government is the taker and that mindset our young people need to challenge सो दिस इज बिन एन आई ओपनर फॉर मी रियली एंड मैं मुझे नहीं पता कि जो सुनने वाले देखने वाले कितना सीख रहे हैं पर मैं बहुत कुछ सीख रही हूँ और जी डी पी हम जब हमेशा अभी सुनते आ रहे थे वो जी पाँच हो गया तो छः हो गया तो सात हो गया नहीं पाँच हो गया नहीं छः हो गया हम अभी पाँच छः सात में बैठे हुए हैं और आप तीस की बात करें पंद्रह नहीं तीस फीसद मतलब जी डी पी होना चाहिए सो द थिंग इज दैट दिस इज अ बिग आई ओपनर फॉर मी एंड शेल वी कंटिन्यू वर्ड महाती जी लेट मी एक्सप्लेन लेट मी करेक्ट फर्ड्स आई डिड नॉट से दैट यू गो द जी डी पी टू थर्टी परसेंट द करंट स्ट्रक्चर वेन आई लुक एट आर जी डी पी इन द पास थर्टी ईयर्स यू टेक एन एवरेज यू नो फॉर इंस्टेंस इफ यू हैव ए जॉब इन द हाउस 
you know what salary you are going to make. Unless and until you get a very high qualification or do something, your salary goes up. So that is called a structural change when you have an additional qualification. In Pakistan's GDP growth, we are stuck at below 4% at an average. Uh, one, it will go up, it will fall down, but you take an average. So that is what the economy is producing. If we need to feed the people who are, you know, the 20 lakh people coming into the labor market every year and give decent living, uh, we need to have more than 8% of GDP growth consistently for 10 years so that we can do that. If you look at China, China had the 18 to 19% GDP growth for almost 15, 20 years. That had a dent on the poverty that had basically lifted the country. So we will struggle. So unless we change the structure of economy, invest more in value added uh, agriculture and export oriented industry, uh, we will not be able to create jobs. I give you examples. Uh, our export, export basically here in is an, um, things which you sell to other countries and they buy you. Now, if you are not producing enough for your own countries, so you don't have a surplus to sell, you see? So you need to put productivity and production needs to really, really go very high. If you go to a supermarket, more than half the things are imported. Uh, we don't even have, you know, these buttons or anything made in Pakistan. So we need to start producing more and enough to start exporting to pay our bills. We are dependent. One of our biggest bill which we pay is the oil bill because we have to import oil. And I'll explain when I come to the solutions that what is to be done. So what Mahathir uh, told me three, four things and what when I have studied deeply in China, how they did that. So they opened up, first of all, investment channels to and drove that investment to sectors of production. You know, if all the investment comes in services, for instance, if you get 200 more McDonald's, is it really helping you? It's all automated system. Maybe each McDonald's will employ 10 Pakistanis. All the income they will make will go out to their principals. So we basically, in, rather than investing in McDonald's and KFCs and others, we need to invest in small industries which can, you know, produce more, export more, so that Pakistan earns dollars. Ye jo dollar manga hota ja hai, the reason being is that we have very limited inflow of dollars and we are importing a lot more. It's an agriculture country and we are even importing basic agriculture items like pulses, for instance, they are all imported. So that is where we are stuck. Now, what China and Malaysia and East Asians did was that they opened up to uh, 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 both foreign and local investors. Foreign investors are particularly, China opened up to foreign, if you look, every second thing is made in China. Now, China did not start inventing those. They started picking up technologies outside, told them that we can make it cheaper than you do, and come and work here. And then they created those economic zones and government because there is a very strong centrally controlled communism, uh, communist government, but they opened up to the market. It will be interesting for you to know that in China, there is no sale and purchase of land. All the land is owned by the state. Now here in Pakistan, I think if you look in the household, half the time the dialogue is about selling and buying of land. So we have been diverted from the real thing. State leases land to people that you make house, you make factories, you make offices, but you don't trade in that. That's not a tradable commodity in China. So we need to learn from these things. So we desperately need to open up to investment. We need to minimize the footprint of government because the more the government, uh, the more what we call corruption, the more slowness, the more bureaucracy, you just open up because yesterday I was giving a talk uh, here at Pakistan Institute of Development Economics. Uh, I was amazed that if somebody needs to open up a pharmacy in Pakistan, they need more than 19 permissions from government offices. 
and if a woman wants to if a uh, woman wants to open it up even she has to uh, submit her nikah nama now you tell me that what does nikah nama have to do by doing business now the more layers we create uh, we create what we call in economic terms sludge people get stuck in that and they get bored now we need to understand that now particularly international investors have multiple options we are strongly competing with cambodia we are competing with bangladesh we are competing by the way we need to learn from bangladesh that's an economy which is going to overtake indian economy in next 10 years time so we need to learn what they did it's no rocket science but the question is that we need to reform our country we need to get rid of you know quick money making by selling and buying commodities the more you sell and buy the more you import look at the number of cars in this country and most of these are imported ones although we put nuts and bolts and assemble it we don't really make it here so we need to curb down on these things and we need to put in uh, you know uh, uh, productive sectors for our own needs but for our own exports and for that each country or a household you have limited resources you cannot do everything now that is the difficult question which our younger people must understand that there are trade offs in life if you have to do it some of the big tycoons their businesses will have to die because they are basically making money on unproductive things in this country country cannot continue subsidizing those from tax payers money you put your money where the best return is best return at the moment one of the thing which you have not exploited and young people have huge potential it has started a little bit now singapore is a country of the size of islamabad they sell 300 million billion dollars of goods globally whereas we sell 20 billion dollars okay and their major portion of malaysia and singapore's exports come from knowledge products so information technology is an area pakistan should open it up to another silicon valley in this country we have 26000 it graduates every year but we need to everybody is looking for a job if we open up even if you are making a game or an app the return is much higher actually than selling a textile item or anything so we need to go where the maximum value is but our traditional businessmen they are still stuck Uh, on a lighter tone i used to travel to china very frequently when i was the minister so in one exhibition in shanghai prime minister i showed it to him china our friends they gave space for our stall right next to them so i showed prime minister china stall where we had waves of this world and technology and reaching out to the space and artificial intelligence that's what they are selling Then I showed Prime Minister our stall where we had a football, we had certain cotton bales and oranges. We are stuck in very basics. We have not invested in innovation. We have not invested in technology transfer. So unless and until so that's where we are paid less. Perhaps we do we put equal amount of effort. Like for instance, as I gave an example of the household. if you have a very basic skill in the household uh, uh, you are basically uh, uh, an accountant okay your income will stick to that unless and until you add to the skill and offer something extra to the market pakistan has failed to diversify and offer extra in what we produce we are stuck on certain traditional items we still take pride in our handicrafts in our textile which is 60% of the you know econ- uh, industry whereas our competitors have moved on they are basically into technology artificial intelligence uh, knowledge products gaming computers uh, we need to learn from india 
India made huge money out of information technology. We have an advantage. Our youth speaks English. Chinese youth does not speak English. We need to translate that English into knowledge products. That's where the world is moving. So it's a topic has become a bit serious, but we need to understand why we are lagging behind. We continue blaming others for our defeats or our slowness. It might have a little component. Biruni Sazash is always there. But all I'm trying to say is that you need to strengthen your house and there is no rocket science in it, but there are trade-offs. Some of the people who are making tons of money by using uh, 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 unfair means and state patronage needs to be cut down. For instance, sugar industry. Pakistan is the only country in the world uh, where all the sugar industry is owned by politicians. So that basically tells the story because politicians, uh, 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 that's what we call that when the taxpayer's money is used for personal gains and it's an uncompetitive industry. I can today buy cheaper sugar from Chile and bring it to Pakistan than the, the price of sugar in Pakistan. That's called uncompetitive. So we need to see where you are competitive. Because God, Allah has given, you know, comparative advantage to each location and country. You can only build on your comparative advantage. Like in sports, for instance, I used to play tennis as you know, still play. But there you have two choices. The trade-off, let me uh, explain in simple words. If you have a weak area in your sports, you have two choices. Either you work on the weak area to improve it and make it competitive or you strengthen your strength. Strengthening your strength is a lot easier. It's your comfort zone. Others are weaker. You will perhaps gain a better result than strengthening your strength rather than basically patronizing a weaker area of your life. So and we are basically patronizing an area where we can't compete. But where we can compete, that is where we need to now move on to. That is what uh, the analysis of economy, Pakistan's economy is. I'm really thrilled uh, at how, the, how much information you have given us today. You have given us a direction and uh, we are now on terra firma, as they say because I think uh, the youth and the different uh, masses of the country will have a better idea of the reality of Pakistan's economy and uh, how its structure is, is and how it should be and what should we do to make the shift in the right direction. Why it is important for us to learn from countries like Singapore and Bangladesh and even India because we have to see where we stand in today's world and where are we going. That is the most important thing. I hope there have been many takeaways for each one of you individually and collectively. So we will look forward to many more such sessions. Thank you and goodbye.